The Prime Minister has spent the week trying to reset his leadership and draw a line in the sand after more than 40% of his own MPs voted to get rid of him. He may have won the vote of confidence, but it threatens to leave the government in stalemate. With a restless party, huge challenges in the economy and the rising cost of living putting millions under intense pressure, how long can that line hold? Boris Johnson made it through a bruising week, but his leadership is still on the line. I'll ask Northern Ireland Secretary Brandon Lewis if a weakened Prime Minister can meet the political and economic challenges ahead. With questions over whether voters are listening to Labour, will Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves offer more help and lower taxes? After bleak warnings about the UK's growth prospects, the Director General of the CBI, which represents many businesses, will tell us how households are reacting. And comedian Harry Hill tells me about turning Tony Blair into a rock opera. You Labour! Drop the old, don't cling to it. You Labour! Wow, it's got a ring to it! <laughs> With me to review the papers, James Graham, the writer behind the big new BBC drama Sherwood, and Katie Balls, the Spectator's deputy political editor. But first, the news with Roger Johnson. Thanks, Sophie. Hello, good morning. The president of Ukraine has said that his troops are running low on ammunition as they try to repel Russian invaders in the east of the country. Volodymyr Zelensky says his forces are holding on for now as they engage in fierce street fighting. He's appealed for more help from Western powers. Yesterday, the European Commission president, Ursula von der Leyen, made a visit to the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, to discuss the country's request to join the European Union. The Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, has said that the government is preparing to repeal a ban on agency staff filling in for striking workers. The change, if it happens, won't come in time to affect the planned walkout by 40,000 rail workers at the end of this month. The strikes are due to take place on the 21st, 23rd and 25th of June, but it is likely that services across the whole week will be disrupted. Tens of thousands of people have been taking part in marches across the United States demanding stricter gun control laws. The demonstrations follow a series of mass shootings, including an attack at an elementary school in Texas in which 19 children and two teachers were murdered. President Biden said that gun control should become an election issue. The Queen has become the second longest reigning monarch in recorded history today. She's now been on the throne for 70 years and 127 days. Only Louis XIV of France has ruled for longer. His reign began when he was just four years old and lasted for more than 72 years. That's it from me. The next news here on BBC One is at one o'clock now. Back to you, Sophie. Roger, thank you very much. Let's have a look at the front pages of the uh, newspapers this morning, starting with the Sunday Telegraph. Tories at war over calls to cat cut taxes is their headline. And uh, the picture there is that little girl who uh, you may well remember was singing Let It Go in a, in a shelter, a bomb shelter in Kiev not so long ago, now singing in Poland uh, a Nations League match between Ukraine and Armenia. The Observer, Johnson faces rural fury over post-Brexit food strategy. A lot of coverage of that um, in the papers uh, this morning. The Sunday Times, Johnson turns his back on the green agenda. The cost of living crisis forces a rethink on rewilding. And the Mail on Sunday, we will not back down on Rwanda. Charles is their headline. This is Pretty Patel's new migrant crackdown after the Prince calls asylum plan appalling. And lots of pictures as well in the papers of David Beckham there on a uh, holiday with his daughter, Harper, in Venice. Stay out of politics, uh, the headline on the front of the Sunday Express. Stay out of politics, Charles. Uh, the Mirror, uh, James Bolger exclusive, a landmark meeting with uh, James Bolger's mum after her 29-year fight. And The Sun on Sunday, uh, newlyweds grim pick after picks is the headline there. Well, to review the papers this morning, the writer James Graham and the spectators Katie Balls. Good morning to morning. both of you. Um, James, you have written an awful lot of... Uh, political drama, let's say. Uh, you've done plays, The House at the National, you've done Ink, which is about Rupert Murdoch, you've done Brexit, The Uncivil War. Uh, the House was all about a vote of confidence. 
Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of coverage of that in the papers. You've chosen this uh, piece by Tim Shipman in the Sunday Times. I have, yes. So Tim Shipman just giving us the inside line on what happened this week. Obviously, very uh, dramatic. The vote of no confidence. Uh, I think for political dweebs like us, it's like our World Cup penalty sh penalty shootout. We get very excited about it. Um, and yes, it's just been um, essentially. I think people are now asking, given that he survived by such a narrow margin, they're asking what next. Uh, there's been an interesting intervention um, from Lord Frost, a former ally, who is essentially saying that uh, Boris Johnson needs to set a clear policy direction. Um, although it doesn't sound like it's going particularly well, uh, one aide uh, th this morning has said um, there was an idea to have this speech with the Chancellor and the Prime Minister to, to, to lay out their new future plan. Um, but the idea to have a speech, he said, predated any ideas about what to actually put in it. So I think, um, you know, from a playwriting point of view, I was always told when you're writing a character, you have to ask three questions of your characters. What do they want? What's stopping them from getting it? And how are they going to go about getting it? Well, obviously, we know what he wants. Boris Johnson wants to stay Prime Minister. But I think the, the vacuum in the answer of those two other questions, why does he want to be Prime Minister, is tormenting not just the Conservative Party, okay, but everyone see, else. 100 days, that's what uh, Tim Shipman said, 100 days to, to stay in the saddle. Oh, that's until the Autumn Party conferences. Yeah, technically, the Prime Minister is safe for 12 months from another confidence vote, but no one really believes that. Um, rules can be changed, and I think the sense is that in the autumn, whether it is the Privileges Committee investigation into Boris Johnson about whether he misled Parliament uh, over Partygate, or whether it is things like cost of living or lack of direction in government, uh, that is going to be the point that gets, things get very difficult for him again. And also, as you say, the conference, uh, seeing the Tory grassroots and whether they actually still back the Prime Minister, which has always been something he has had going for him. And I think you're seeing across the papers because uh, you have lots of MPs saying well uh, there are lots of things I'm uncomfortable about right now in terms of Downing Street um, but one of them is the lack of clear direction there's now lots of debates going on uh, so uh, you have the observer saying Johnson faces rural fury over the post Brexit food strategy and this is leading figures in the farming industry saying there's not enough help there the plans have been slimmed down but then on the other hand the Sunday Times is saying Johnson turns his back on the green agenda and I think this is a, a new development in the Sunday Times, which is effectively saying uh, Boris Johnson's big plans, former plans uh, to focus on rewilding are actually going to be taking a back seat now and the focus is food production. And I think that is meant to be something to keep some of the rural voters on side ahead of a very tricky by-election, uh, later this month, two tricky by-elections, but one in the rural constituency of Tiverton and Honiton. And looking at, I think, after that, we saw with the Tresham and Amersham by-election, the lots of people said this is because of the government's planning reform being very unpopular. I think we're starting to see number 10 try to get ahead of the curve by saying we're going to do things that will uh, try to please farmers and rural voters like more. grow for Britain. I mean, that's yes, what the, the exactly. Prime Minister is apparently going to be talking about tomorrow, this new plan to, to grow more food here so that we're not reliant on, on the sort of things that are coming from, from abroad. Yes, exactly. And the focus being growing for Britain and food production, as opposed to talk of rewilding and, uh, you know, using large um, swathes of agricultural land um, for more uh, kind of nature-based plans. There is a lot of jostling in these papers this yeah. morning, isn't there? A lot of, uh, have, you, have you spotted that as well, James? A lot, of, a lot of jostling for position. A lot of people, as Tom uh, Tugendhat, who's written a, a, a piece, hasn't he? An opinion piece. Uh, there's an attack on Jeremy Hunt as well in the mail. Um, yes, and I think we're seeing in, this, in the Sunday Telegraph, I mean, Tories at war over calls to cut taxes. Um, and I think uh, we've seen over the weekend, I think Boris Johnson is clearly still in position. But I think since that vote on Monday, you are seeing his authority sap away in the fact that you have some who are not in government, such as Tom Tugendhat, but other figures coming out and saying we should do tax cuts soon. And I think you are seeing quite a lot of a leadership parade in some of these stories. How, how does all, this all play out in terms of your kind of, you know, looking for inspiration for, for drama? How does it play out? Well, I mean, I think historically it's very rare for a vote of no confidence to happen and for that leader to survive until the next general election. I think John Major just about did it, but he called it in himself. Um, but I, obviously I think there is, you know, there is a sense that um, the, this country is <laughs> suffering under incredibly severe challenges. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not surprised that there were all these philosophical debates happening uh, in the papers this morning to ask which, what is the direction of travel that Boris Johnson is going to take us if he's going to survive. Uh, you've been looking at the uh, the ones there, the the nine nine nine. What does it say on on the brink? That's in the in the mirror. Yes, yeah, so this is in the Sunday Mirror, and essentially the depressing news statistic that it takes on average now about 51 minutes 
uh, which make a call to the ambulance service to uh, to arrive. And I think that reflects uh, quite a few stories um, in the Sunday papers today, talking about essentially infrastructure and public services and how uh, how under pressure they are uh, post pandemic and post Brexit. Um, and essentially, I think it's in the uh, also in the was it the Sunday Times? Sunday uh, Times, yes, absolutely. Or, big um, piece about uh, big all piece kinds by, of delays. By, whether it's at the, the airport, so there's a lot of focus as well, isn't there, exactly. on travel so, this summer? Yeah, and Josh Glancy asking the question, I think we're all asking is, is anything working at the moment? Uh, the, the courts are completely blocked uh, with, with cases. The NHS is under pressure. There's obviously the cost of living crisis. There's a potential summer of strikes. And I think that to me, I don't know what you think, Katie, but to me that speaks to um, the seeming disparity uh, between the scale of the challenges facing people and the, um, the ability for our politicians at the moment to think on a, on a scale and an ambition to come up with transformative policies uh, to, to, to fix them. We, you know, we do have a housing crisis, we have an energy crisis, we have a climate crisis, a cost of living crisis. And yet it feels like the, the, at the moment government and, and particularly the, some of the, the ministers in the cabinet are, are tinkering around the surface of this. And I don't know whether that's, that's uh, a new problem or an old problem, but in, in, you know, um, in, in my experience, uh, when you look back at history, these moments, these significant moments like 1945, 1979, they require uh, a level of, of ambitious transformative policies that I just don't think we're particularly seeing from our leaders at the moment. Yeah, and I think one of the issues here is uh, clearly the government seems very overwhelmed by these problems, some of which, uh, you know, problems other countries are facing when it comes to coming out of the pandemic. Well, uh, cost like, of for living. example, I mean, airlines, yeah. we're not alone yeah. in facing terrible delays and problems. The, uh, I think um, Schiphol Airport yeah. is, is having the same sort of problems, long delays, cancellations. Exactly. And I, but I think one of the issues when you look across the political landscape, it's not so, uh, you know, it's just the Tories here. There is also, you know, questions about Labour when it comes to the strikes coming up. So we are potentially heading to a summer of very painful strikes and travel disruption. And you are currently seeing within the Labour Party too, which is picked up in some of the papers today, uh, you know, what is actually the position when it comes to those train strikes? Uh, you have uh, figures in Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet being accused of, you know, trying to flash and leg to the left uh, by saying that, that, you know, for example, West Street and saying that if he, he would have been one of those people if he was a train uh, driver in that situation and I think it just does show you that this is a that no one is really finding it easy to tackle uh, these problems or that well, there's that clear vision coming out yeah, and that, there's rail strikes looming, and there is a lot of focus on them in the papers this morning, isn't there? Yes, exactly. And I think that, again, when it comes to uh, hearing from uh, what the Tories plan to do, which is, of course, looking at... Um, repealing the legal repealing ban. Us. But even, even when you press the details, and no one thinks that's going to stop what's about to happen. Um, this could be something uh, when it comes to minimum staffing and things, but I don't think there is a sense in government this is going to stop the immediate pain, and it's already starting to become a little bit of a you know, political football in many ways in terms of uh, can the Tories use this to attack Labour and I think that's what they're going to try to do. Lots of coverage of Prince Charles as well you've got there Katie um, and uh, his private comments about the flights to Rwanda. Yes so this week should be uh, if there is not a successful challenge the first week that the government's plan to send Rangas to Rwanda t um, happens. Now I think dominating yesterday's papers and then carried on today is that the Prince Prince Charles uh, criticised the plan heavily. Um, and I think often when you see uh, a government policy being ripped apart or criticised, you think they're bad news for the government. But I think it's worth pointing out that I think in this case, Number 10 are quite up for the fight. They almost want uh, you know, the courts to, to go for it and tr try and stop it, or people to criticise it so uh, you know, they can make it into a wedge issue. You've had members of Boris Johnson's team privately say they see this as an ideal wedge issue. So I think we're going to see more and more, actually, in terms of ministers, as we are seeing with the Home Secretary today, Day saying, uh, you know, doesn't matter who tries to stop us, we're going to push on. I, I think they are to, are to a degree leaning into this. James, tell us about the piece in the Telegraph um, today, which says that uh, it talks about more and more people watching drama based on on real stories. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a piece um, by Jake Carriage in the Telegraph, which is talking about. Well, he asked the question. Is there too much drama on our screens that is essentially based on real life, whether that's the distant past like The Crown or true crime stories like Landscapers or my own drama, which I've got coming up this morning, uh, sorry, uh, tomorrow. So, um, so, I mean, I must take some responsibility for this problem <laughs> if, it is, it, if yes. it is a problem. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm more relaxed than Jake is about it. I do, I do think he's correct that there does seem to be quite a lot of real life dramas. But then I think we have a lot of real life dramas in the world at the moment. And I think historically, um, theatre and films and television have always uh, tried to make sense 
of, of the real world. In fact, without being massively pretentious, if you go back 2,000 years, it was theatre that came before democracy and allowed the conditions for democracy to exist because getting together and telling stories about the world is often how we've made, how we've made sense of it. And I also think it underestimates the amount of um, original talent that we actually do have in this country. When you think of original stories like Dairy Girls or Succession, which is a team of mainly British writers, uh, a new series of Happy Valley, one of my favourite series of I all love time. Happy Valley too, uh, yeah. By Sally Wainwright. So uh, he's right to check in, but I, d I don't think we have a particular problem. So your new series that starts tomorrow, Sherwood, um, on BBC One, and it is a crime drama. It's based on true stories about two murders. Um, well, I'm going to show a clip, but it's just to, to explain. It's, it's two policemen we see here, one from the Metropolitan Police who has returned to Nottinghamshire yes. um, years after the miners' strike, the 1984 strikes. And this is an area that you've come from. Yes. You know it very well. And it's about two police officers uh, reflecting on what's happened, community torn apart, and those deep, deep scars. Let's just have a quick look very quickly. Yeah, that's true. So it, it's set in the village where I grew up in North Nottinghamshire, which is one of the red wall towns that seems to be the focus of most political opinion at the moment. And it is um, loosely inspired by uh, some tragedy and some trauma that happened in my, my village. But because I know a lot of these people, I've fictionalised those characters so that they don't have to go through that trauma again. Um, but you're right. I mean, I, I, we, um, we essentially wanted to write a, a crime drama but that eventually breaks out of that genre and hopefully gets to examine a lot of the political tensions that still exist in former pit villages. And as you saw, so that's essentially um, in the 1980s, as a lot of people will remember, the Metropolitan Police came into these communities to police the picket lines and caused a great deal of, of upset often. And the irony of this particular tragedy is, yes, there was uh, a couple of killings in, in my community that brought the Met Police back decades later in order to catch the killers. But it just reawakened a lot of those, those tensions mm. that still exist between people who made different choices during that strike. Well, I look forward to watching more, James Graham. Thank you, thank you very much. Katie Balls, thank you as well for reviewing the papers for us this morning. Time for the weather now with Chris Fawkes. I came into work, the first thing somebody said to me, that it's going to be hotter than Hawaii here this week. Is that true? Well, I suppose it depends which bit of Hawaii you're talking about, because uh, Honolulu gets to about 31 degrees later this week. We'll be about the same level. Top of the mountains in Hawaii gets to about 3 degrees, so it depends which bit you're talking about, I suppose. But warm weather is on the way. We've got some warm sunshine to come as we go on through the day today, but it's later in the week that we'll probably see temperatures topping out at around 30 degrees Celsius across parts of southeast England. And before we get there, today we've got some fairly blustery weather across the northern half of the country with gusts of wind running into the 30s of miles an hour. That will bring some scattered showers across Scotland, Northern Ireland and across parts of northwest England. Temperatures here around 17 at best, but further southwards the winds are lighter and in the sunshine which is going to be widespread we should see temperatures hitting about 23 which is going to feel pleasantly warm. Overnight tonight, a little bit more rain to come across the far northwest of Scotland. Uh, temperatures about 8 to 11 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow, well, we've got lighter winds around. And so with a bit more sunshine eventually breaking through across Scotland and Northern Ireland, it should feel a little bit warmer here. But that said, there will be a little rain working across the highlands into Orkney and Shetland late in the day. The best of the sunshine again further southwards. Temperatures quite widely reaching the low 20s across England and Wales, but feeling warmer across Scotland and Northern Ireland as the winds turn lighter. But it's later in the week it's set to get a lot hotter, particularly across England and Wales. That's the latest, Sophie. That is quite hot. Chris, thank you. The UK economy will stagnate next year, meaning the country will go from the second fastest growing in the G7 group of nations to the slowest in 2023. That is the latest prediction from the leading think tank, the OECD. The business group, the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, has its own forecast of what will happen. Its director general, Tony Danker, joins me now. Good morning. Good morning. You've been doing a lot of research. You're publishing your own forecast for the economy next year. Give us a sense of what it will all mean for households? Well, I think the truth is households are going to go into recession this year. What do I mean by that? I mean that consumption, spending that we all make uh, in the high streets and on discretionary goods, that is going to go negative already this year. And the only thing really stopping us from having a full-blown recession this year is that at the moment, business investment levels are quite high. The risk is if business investment starts to fall, then the whole country could go into recession sooner than some are predicting, i.e. next year. So I think that's why at the moment there's not a lot you can do about household spending when inflation is this high. But you do need to stabilise confidence amongst firms so that they don't you know, stop spending too. Did you get an, any idea or any sense of how households are changing 
their, their spending patterns already. Yeah, look, I think already you're seeing households are trading down. It's a well-known behavior when there's high inflation, right? They're not buying as many discretionary goods or they're buying the cheaper option in the supermarkets. That's happening already, right? This idea that it's going to be next year where we face recessionary uh, risks, I think actually they're happening this year. It's why I've said this morning that actually, although political drama is incredibly good for television, it's pretty bad for economics. And so I think the government need to recognize uh, confidence building, economic confidence building rather than political confidence building is actually the order of the day right now. You've actually called in an interview in the paper today for a, a COBRA meeting on the economy. I mean, that's the sort of meeting you have when there's a, a terrorist attack or the pandemic yeah. or a real national crisis. Is that the sort of crisis you really think we're facing? Well, look, I, I don't think we need to have a great national crisis to start behaving in the way the government behaved during the pandemic, right? The government really did exert grip. It got a team of external advisors. It had, you know, daily, weekly meetings in the COBRA room. It took very quick decisions. It got things moving. That's the kind of behaviour we need from government now, right? Business as usual, let's have a budget in November and let's keep having a debate amongst the Conservative Party about what's the right way to do taxes or how should we get harder on Brexit. That stuff doesn't help. We need to put the events of last week behind us and we need to have a Prime Minister and a Chancellor co-chairing meetings, bringing all of government together and making the big decisions quickly rather than waiting for budgets, making big decisions quickly that ensures that confidence stabilises and we avoid recession. Whether or not it's in the COBRA room or the cabinet room, it doesn't really matter. We need to elevate the status of the economy in the political discourse. Can we avoid a recession? Yes, I think we can. I mean, look, there's a very uh, simple chain of events, which is when business confidence is high, businesses invest and grow, recession is avoided. When business confidence falls, investment falls, and it is the only thing at the moment stopping us from recession. So anything that can be done to boost business confidence, to demonstrate that actually government is incredibly serious and purposeful about growth, will work. But if we have a summer of politics like we've had in the last week, that will undermine confidence. The Prime Minister said on Friday that growth and the economy is his top priority. There is a fear of stagflation as well. Yeah. How much of a danger is there of stagflation, which is basically economic stagnation at a time of rising pr uh, prices? Look, technically speaking, stagflation also involves rising unemployment. And I don't think that is an immediate risk. But yes, we do have a hit to growth and a massive hit on inflation. So managing the economy right now is tough, right? I mean, I, I sometimes compare it to clutch control. You want some growth so that any downturn is not long and prolonged. But if you overheat the economy, if we have massive pay settlements, if we have massive tax cuts right now, that will overheat the economy. And so I think, you know, the government have got a tough job to get this right. But if they give up on the, on the tailwinds that drive growth, then the headwinds, I'm afraid, will blow us over. So what do you say to business leaders now it, who will be asked a lot by employees for, for pay rises because yeah. that's how people can cope with rising prices? What are you saying to business leaders? Don't do it. Don't give pay rises. No, I think business leaders have to give pay rises and are giving pay rises, pay rises they never thought they'd give. Does but that not fuel do, inflation? Well, what they can't do is give inflationary level pay rises, right? We have debates now in the public sector about inflationary level pay rises. Those are A, unaffordable, and B, will exacerbate the inflation risk. You know, this is why inflation is so damaging and why we're not really going to get consumer spending back until inflation starts to fall. The key is to keep confidence amongst firms in the economy high so that that will get us through difficult times. Tony Danker, thank you very much for joining thank us you. this morning. So that is a business's view of what will happen to the economy. On Friday, the Prime Minister did give a speech in which he said boosting economic growth will be his top priority. The answer to the current economic predicament is not more tax and more spending. The answer is economic growth. And you can't spend your way out of inflation and you can't tax your way into growth. So that's why the time has come for this government to do uh, what it's been straining at the leash to do uh, for two years, but which has been difficult during the COVID crisis. Well, that was the Prime Minister speaking on Friday, and it looks like the economy will be at the centre of the next election. Rachel Reeves is the Shadow Chancellor, and she has got to come up with Labour's plan. Good morning. Thank you for Good joining morning, us, Sophie. Should people expect even more support from, from a government, whether it be a future Labour government or the government now, to help them cope with this crisis, or do they just have to think they're on their own? 
Well, people are still struggling with the rising cost of living. Uh, obviously, the gas and electricity bills, the weekly food shop. The news this week that for some people it's costing £100 to fill up the car with petrol. Uh, and so many people need their cars, of course, to get to work. I welcome the fact that the government have finally introduced the windfall tax on the big profits being made by oil and gas companies. I remember the first interview I did with you, Sophie, uh, at the beginning of January. I called for the government to do that. Uh, and then a Conservative minister came on after and said, oh, no, that would be the wrong thing to do because the energy companies are struggling. Well, they've eventually uh, got rid of that rhetoric and done the right thing. But we also need more than just sticking plaster approaches. And that is what I fear we're getting from this government, lurching from one crisis to the next without a proper plan to get the economy growing and to deal with inflation. It's why today I'm setting out Labour's plan for a stronger and more secure economy to secure our energy supplies, our supply chains, and also to give businesses the security, the confidence building that Tony Danko was just speaking to you about. What about tax cuts? Is that the way forward? Should there be a tax? The, the Chancellor has said that there will be a 1p tax cut in 2024. Should, would you support that? Well, this is the Chancellor who has increased taxes 16 times in two years. And one of the other things that I said to you back in January was that the government shouldn't be going ahead with the increases in national insurance. They've increased national insurance. We are the only G7 economy that is actually increasing taxes on working people and the businesses that employ them right in the middle of a cost of living crisis. It makes no sense at all. So, you know, the Chancellor says, oh, we might cut taxes in a couple of years. Oh, well, that doesn't help people now when they are facing these staggering increases in the price of everything. So, you know, the Chancellor, instead of promising help in the future, it's always tomorrow, they shouldn't have done this national insurance increase uh, that went ahead in April. And I did ask you about that at the time and what you would do if you win the next election. Would you repeal that? Would you scrap it? Well, we don't know what situation we're going to be in at the next election. The Chancellor's saying that taxes might go down before then. So let's see where we are at the next election. But I can tell you, if I was Chancellor now, that national insurance increase wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't be doing that. But, but the next election people... might be two years away, Sophie. And so we don't know where national insurance, where income tax will be by then. So we'll set out the plans then and you'll be the first to, to hear them. Don't people need to know that, though, ahead of an election? And I remember asking you that back in January and you didn't want to say then either. And that is, as you say, it's a tax rise. So if you were in government, would you not scrap it? Well, if I was in government now, absolutely I would. But I can't say where we're going to be in two years. You, you know what the economy is like at the moment. We, we've got the lowest growth. We've got the highest inflation. But the OECD said this week that Britain is in a unique situation of um, having a situation where we've got a rising inflation, uh, rising uh, taxes. And, and that is why these tax increases are so damaging right now, because it's taking money out of people's pockets before they pay a single bill or fill up their car with so, petrol. So, you're, so saying that you're saying they're damaging. So would you cut income tax by 1p, as Rishi Sunak says he will do in 2024? Well, the thing that we should be doing right now is reversing that national insurance uh, increase. That would be my priority if I was Chancellor um, today because it's taking money out of people's pockets. But look, would I'm you, also Would you bring out... forward income, income um, tax cuts now? Would you start... Would you? decrease that now? Well, what the government, the government got this sort of hokey-cokey where they are increasing national insurance but say they're going to reduce income uh, tax. Uh, national insurance is a tax only on the income that you get through going out to work. That's why it is such a damaging tax increase right in the middle of a cost of living crisis. But, but Sophia, I'm also trying to set out our plans for a stronger and more secure economy so we don't just lurch from crisis uh, to crisis. Look, for example, at energy policy. We published a dossier today that shows that energy bills this year are £9 billion higher than they would have been if the government had done some of the practical things over the last few years, like insulating people's homes, like not going ahead with the um, getting rid of the gas storage facilities, like investing in onshore and offshore uh, wind. Because of this government's failure, people are paying uh, through the roof for their gas and electricity bills. It doesn't have to be like that. But Family finances could be stronger and more secure. And, and, and I'm setting out how that can be the case. And going back to the idea of tax, what I, I still cannot get clear is what you would actually do on income tax. Would you cut income tax 
like the Chancellor says he will. I've been very clear that I want to see taxes on working people as low as possible. At the moment, the priority should be not doing this national insurance increase. Uh, the government are promising things in the future. People don't want uh, to know what's going to happen in a couple of years' time. They want to know that the government is helping them now uh, when they are facing these astronomical increases in the cost of living. What about the, uh, the fuel, which you've mentioned already? I mean, the cost of filling up an average fam family car has just hit more than £100. The Chancellor's already cut 5p off fuel duty. Should it be cut further? Well, one of the things that really concerns me is the fact that even when the government cuts fuel duty, that doesn't actually get passed on to consumers. And what we need to have is a proper review by the Competition and Markets Authority. I see that the Business Secretary has finally got around to saying that today, because naming and shaming, which was their previous policy, just was never going to uh, work. We need to make sure that we've got a functioning energy market that when fuel duty is uh, cut, and indeed when uh, uh, oil prices come down, that is actually experienced by people uh, in their pockets. But it, it's also why, uh, you know, to come back to this national insurance thing again, it makes no sense to be increasing taxes so that even before they fill up their car with petrol, they've actually got less money in their pockets. But That's why what the government is doing today by putting taxes up on working people is so counterproductive. But the question I'm asking is, should they go further? They've already cut 5p. Should they cut it more? Would you cut it more? Well, I would like to see them get a grip on what's happening at the fore. Would you cut it more, though? I, I think the priority right now would be making sure that the cuts that are happening... Because, you know, you cut it more, it might not even get passed on because you've got the profiteering at the forecourts. And that's why you've got to sort out some of these market problems. Otherwise, you could cut it again and it might not actually get passed on to consumers again. So that's why it's important that the Competition and Markets Authority do a, a, a quick review and make sure that this market is functioning so that when prices do fall... It's actually consumers, people filling up their cars with petrol, who experience those cuts in prices. I've asked you about income tax and whether or not you would cut it. I've asked you about uh, national insurance, whether you would scrap it if you won the next election, and also about putting up fuel duty. And you haven't actually given me an answer on any of those. Is, do you have the answers but you can't tell us, or you're not sure? Well, we're in a situation at the moment where the OECD is saying that next year Britain is going to have the lowest growth and the highest inflation. The government have got... Um, uh, uh, our economy into a right mess. So I'm not going to set out detailed policies for the next election, uh, but I am setting out uh, Labour's plans for a, a stronger and more secure uh, economy. And that means insulating 2 million homes a year to take £400 off people's gas and electricity bills. It means ending the effective moratorium on onshore uh, wind. And it means regulating the energy market uh, properly uh, so that we don't have a situation where firms can enter the market and then go bankrupt and, and pass those costs on to consumers. Consumers. Well, Those are things that would take money off people's gas and electricity bills and make them uh, better off. Also speaking today, or trying to, uh, about how we would sort out some of the supply chain issues in the economy. Because Brexit is making it harder for British companies uh, to export. The type of Brexit deal that the government uh, uh, secured. What about and how we would sort out some of that mess as well what about to the, help what about our the, businesses. What about the train strikes, which are um, threatening millions of people a week on Tuesday, the first one? Your colleague, Wes Streeting, said he'd vote to go on strike if he were a member of the R RMT, would you? Well, I, I'm not a train... Uh, I don't work in uh, the North train seat. industry. I'm the shadow chancellor, and I want to be chancellor. So I'll tell you what I would do in this role. If I was the chancellor of the Exchequer, which is the role I aspire to do, I would be doing everything within my powers. This government are acting uh, like arsonists rather than firefighters, and it is grossly irresponsible because people who need to get to work on the trains, people who need to get to doctors and hospital appointments, businesses like Tony Danker from the CBI was just talking about, who are desperate to you know, help get the economy growing again need our train service to be functioning properly so and do so you the government the strikes I don't want to see strikes, but nor do people who work in the rail industry want to see strikes. They want to see the government working with the industry, working with trade unions to resolve this. But this government, as per usual, seem to be more interested in sowing chaos, in sowing division, than actually in resolving the issues. One of your that wouldn't be my approach if I was the Chancellor. Another of your colleagues, Lisa Nandy, says she is on the side of the rail workers. Are you? 
I, look, I, I totally understand why people who work in the rail industry feel that things are just not working for them, that their pay is not going up uh, in line with cost of living. There are threats of, uh, of redundancies. And now today the government are, are saying that they're going to bring in agency workers, which will make uh, it less safe to travel on the rail. So, you know, I, I fully understand the concerns that people who have in, in, in the rail industry, and they are desperate for the government to get a grip and listen to their concerns rather than fanning the flames of this dispute, what they seem determined to do. The leader of the RMT union, um, Mick Lynch, says that Keir Starmer hasn't made it clear if he's on the side of the workers or of the bosses. Whose side is he on? Well, well Labour Party, the clue is in the name, we're the party of, of working people. Uh, the, that's how we were formed. That's where our interests lie. We always support working people. But, you know, working people do not want this industrial dispute. The people who work on our railways want this resolved. The people who need to get to work uh, to earn a living, they want this resolved as well. The only people, you know, who don't seem to want this dispute resolved are the government because they prefer to sow division than they do to resolve disputes. So the RMT are actually, want, they want a pay rise. Um, they want a, a pay rise above RPI inflation, which is 11%. So they basically want a, an 11% pay rise. Should they get it? Well, look, there's lots of different things as part of this dispute. It's not just about pay. It's also about redundancies in the sector. It's also about uh, safety in the rail industry. The, the rail workers are part of what kept our economy going during the pandemic. They were some of the key workers who we clapped, who, um, uh, who kept things um, uh, going during those really difficult times. Uh, they are not the enemy here. Uh, they are looking to secure a good deal for their workers. Uh, I understand why they're trying to do that. I want the government to try and resolve this dispute. Can I just ask you about something that the deputy leader Angela Rayner said she was talking to the BBC this week she was talking about Keir Starmer and she said that off camera he's he sort of comes alive on camera maybe not so much she said he comes across as too much of a lawyer he takes the emotion out of things and she actually said he needs to put some more welly into it do you agree? Well, look, we've got a contrast, haven't we, about who we want to be Prime Minister after the next election. We can carry on as we are with uh, somebody who lies and he cheats and he uh, says one thing and, and, and does another. That's the Prime Minister. Or we can have Keir Starmer, a man of honesty, integrity and decency, who's determined to restore uh, a trust and some sense of decency into uh, public life. Voters have a choice at the next election. I certainly know which I would choose. But your deputy leader says he needs to put some more welly into it. Well, we all need to. You know, we need to take the fight to uh, the Tories. We've got two really important by-elections coming up in less than two weeks' time in Tiverton and Honiton and, and in Wakefield. It's a, an opportunity for the voters to do what Tory MPs failed to do last Monday, which is send a message that although the Tory MPs might still have confidence in this Prime Minister, the British people uh, lost confidence in him long ago. Rachel Reeves, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, 25 years after New Labour's victory in 1997, a new stage show has opened in North London, not far from where Tony Blair lived before he moved into Downing Street. The comedian Harry Hill is one of the two people behind Tony the Rock Opera, a tongue-in-cheek take on Blair's life and times. It includes characters as diverse as George Bush, Gordon Brown and Saddam Hussein. I met up with Harry and the co-writer Steve Brown and began by asking... Why choose Tony Blair as the focus for a musical? Oh, my God, this is a very difficult question. Oh Why have we written a musical about <laughs> Tony Blair? Yeah, now you've got me. Purely for financial gain. <laughs> New Labour! Drop the old, don't cling to it. New Labour! Wow, it's got a ring to it. It's modern as in modern jazz. It's new, improved and just like jazz. And certainly it's got pizzazz. The way no other party has you uh, Well, I thought it was just a, a great story. I, I can't remember. I mean, I had the idea <clears throat> maybe five or six years ago uh, because it, it's a brilliant kind of Shakespearean tragedy in many ways. It's an yeah. arc. It's it an describes arc. an arc. It describes an arc. So it, he starts off as a sort of peace-loving hippie in many ways, he joins a band in Oxford because he wants to be Mick Jagger, he gets a guitar that he calls Clarence. He's in the band Ugly Rumours. Front man. Front man. His favourite position. Yeah. And then obviously he's swept to power, you know. A new dawn has broken, has it not? Let two landslides and then it all goes horribly wrong for him, in, you know, depending on your view. But basically he then becomes a kind of... Uh, 
Once loved and then thoroughly reviled, you know. Yeah. Both, as somebody put it, from Messiah to Pariah. I mean, it is a comedy and it is a musical. You have set it to music. You have a tango, for example. Yes. With, uh, Tony Blair of... and Cherie. Tell me about that. Yes, well, that's a lovely moment. You see, there has to be a love story, they always say, traditionally in a musical. And obviously there's, there's that one. I mean, there's another love story, which is its own self-love. And give me an idea of some of the songs, because you've you used, for example, The People's Princess, yeah. Tony Blair's sort of eulogy about yeah. Princess Diana when she died. There's another one with Gordon Brown, isn't there? He, yes, which, he has in which you use his, one of his speeches. Yes, that's right. Well, Harry originally had it as uh, uh, just some dialogue, uh, and it was to, to make... Uh, to underscore uh, how tedious and droning he could sound. I like Gordon Brown, by the way. I think he's really great. Um, and uh, you read it, it's a very dry bit of speech um, concerning macroeconomics. And I said to Harry, you know what, this little bit here where he's being dull, I, I said I could make that sort of an operatic recitative sort of thing. And he went, oh, yeah, that's how, mm. go ahead and do it. So he has this thing where he goes, uh, Market forces cannot educate us or equip us In this world of rapid technological and economic change Yeah. He's good. Yeah. yeah. He's got the acoustics and everything. I like it. <laughs> I like it. I'd like to teach the world to sing with new labour so In terms of the audience who, who are going to come to this, is it people who love Tony Blair, people who loathe Tony Blair, or, or will they both appreciate it? You know, the people who don't like him will say we're probably not hard enough on him, and the people who like him will say we were um, too hard on him. Mm. What we've tried to do is not make it kind of too finger-wagging or, you know, party political, so we're sort of leaving the audience, I hope, to make up their own minds. Yes, and people have said, oh, are you, is it very anti-him, or is it very for, I mean... And what is it? Well, bit of both. It, it is uh, even-handed, dare I say. Because what does it make you think about politics now? What's going on now when you've, you're concentrating on well, remember uh, 25 when, years on? Well, yeah, remember when Tony Blair first came to power, he was considered a, a lightweight, a bit of a lightweight, and now he <laughs> looks, <laughs> you know, comparatively. Yeah, she whiz, yeah. Uh, and I, th I think the other thing, I was thinking this morning, actually, I think as, the, as an electorate, we've become rather passive in that what we do is we tend to, I think, I'm certainly guilty of this, you, we sit back and complain, but we don't really want to get involved. Wait. It's a little bit arm's length. You're back on the road, aren't you, quite soon? Uh, I'm back on tour in uh, October, first time I've been on tour for, uh, must be nearly 10 years, so I'm looking forward to that, yeah, yeah. A stand-up tour, a lot of people don't realise that I'm a stand-up comedian. Yeah. Really? They think I'm just the, you know, the voice of you've been framed. Oh, dear old lady falling over and we can see her knickers. See you after the break. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I always think of myself, you know, primarily as a stand-up. That's I, how I started. And... I actually saw you in 1991, when you were just starting out. That's, that's, you did that for a long time, didn't you? I gave, well, I gave up my job as a doctor in 1990. And, uh, you know, I thought I'd give myself a year. And it's turned into 30 years. Yeah. Well, back on the road. Um, very good luck with it, Thank and you. Uh, enjoy enjoy it, and good luck with the show here. Thank, Thank you. you both Thank very you. much for, for talking time. to us this Thanks morning. for taking Thank an you. interest. <laughs> now, the Conservative Party voted this week to say it did have confidence in the Prime Minister, but with 41% wanting him gone, could it turn out to be a hollow victory? Brandon Lewis is the Northern Ireland Secretary and the former Party Chairman, and he joins me now. Good morning. Morning. So, 41% of Tory <coughs> MPs have told the M told uh, the Prime Minister that he is not fit to be Prime Minister. They want him gone. If 41% of your own staff said that about you, how would you feel? Uh, well, look, we as a Conservative Party, we're a big, wide open tent. I think actually, if you look at the result, the Prime Minister actually secured uh, more votes than he got even at the time he won the leadership. And one of the benefits of the Conservative Party, so I used to be chairman, I've, something I know well, is we are a very big, wide and open tent, which means you have different people with different views. But at the end of the day, we're Democrats. We had the vote. Prime Minister's had that vote of confidence and he's going to get on with the job. But how would you feel about it? 
Well, look, you want to know 100% of your team are with you. And actually, what I think has happened since Monday is all of our colleagues respect that decision as they did when he won the leadership vote. As I say, he won it by even bigger than he got when he won the leadership vote. And they want to get on with focusing on the issues that affect people day to day. And I think colleagues will continue to come together in that way. Have you spoken to Boris Johnson about it? Have you asked him how he feels about it? I, look, oh, yes, I had meetings with uh, the Prime Minister through the course of this week, and he is absolutely focused. And I've got to say this, even before the vote, my dealings with him over the last few weeks and months and this week has been his focus focus, laser focused on the issues that are affecting constituents across the United Kingdom. He has called it, as you say, a convincing victory, a decisive result. If you lose both these by-elections which are coming up the week after next, do you think that the Prime Minister will face another confidence vote? Uh, no, at two levels. One is, I'm not convinced, I think there's a chance we could do better in these by-elections than people think. Of course, we've got a Prime Minister who is one of the only Prime Ministers in history to actually win a by-election from the opposition whilst in government. Um, so I think we've got a pretty good record. Now, usually governments don't do very well in by-elections. It's a difficult period when you're halfway through a parliament. We've got to be practical and realistic about that. But look, I think the parties had a vote. It comes together now and we focus on issues united behind the Prime Minister. He's a man of history though, isn't he? Boris Johnson likes his history. He will know better than anyone else really. Theresa May won a, a confidence vote, Margaret Thatcher won a confidence vote. Both were forced out within the next 12 months or so. John Major won a confidence vote. He went on to fight an election, but he was trounced at the next election. What makes you think that Boris Johnson can achieve what they couldn't? Oh, a couple of things. Look, first of all, uh, in 2011, people said he couldn't win the uh, re-election as the Mayor of London, and less than a year later, he did. In the run-up to 2019, people said we couldn't, people thought we were going to lose the general election, and Boris Johnson, as Prime Minister, secured the biggest vote for us, arguably, in terms of our majority, than we've seen since the days of Margaret Thatcher. So the Prime Minister is somebody who continually goes into elections and does very, very well. Because he's focused on the issues, I think people want to see us focus on, and he'll continue to do that. Look, we've got a, we've got a graphic here with the uh, approval ratings, the Prime Minister's approval ratings, um, you can see there. And is that really an election winning position? Well, I can only go on what I see in practice. And in 2019, as I say, people came out and voted for the Prime Minister, gave an overwhelming mandate of the British people, which followed, of course, the mandate the Conservative Party gave him a few months earlier. Uh, he is somebody who consistently does well and wins elections. And I've got to say, my constituents, the, my mailbox, my email, email box, as well as hard post box, uh, is very clear. The support is there for the Prime Minister. You don't get criticism in your mailbox about the uh, Prime Minister? I, I've got to say, genuinely, the criticism I've had in my mailbox has been people I know are Labour supporters or Labour activists in my constituency. What I've had generally on doorsteps and in my mailbox and elsewhere in the country, I say, is people want to see us getting on with the living for people. And that's what the Prime Minister's focus is so on. So no Conservatives within your constituency are contacting you and saying they don't have confidence or they're... they're uh, yeah, no, I've had to say, in my... Look, I can only talk for my constituency. I've had people in full support of the Prime Minister. And actually, even today, I've had uh, supportive messages from the Chairman of the Conservatives in Northern Ireland as well around the work the Prime Minister's doing and that we should get on with the job. The economy is going to be a central focus uh, now and over the next few years. Why do you think, according to the OECD, that the UK is predicted to have the lowest economic growth in the next year of any major economy apart from Russia? Well, because I think, look, <clears throat> we've all, and this is a global issue, obviously, we're seeing with, uh, the pressures on inflation. We've just come through where we've been one of the fastest growing uh, countries in the, in the modern world in terms of, and we've had that 0.8% growth in the first part of this year. Also, the OECD obviously recognises and has outlined that after a period, we will then go back to being one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing. Uh, so there is, there is what, what you get with the economy. My economics degree is uh, some years behind me now, but you do get these fluctuations. We've had a period where we've been one of the fastest growing. We will return to that we as well. We were the fastest growing because we fell further than anybody else during the pandemic, well, actually, the start of the pandemic. Well, I'd slightly we, change it as well. We grew quickly. Yeah, we grew quickly, not least of all, because the Prime Minister made the right decision to bring us out of the pandemic restrictions against Labour's advice earlier than others, so our economy was able to get going quicker. But as you say, other, other countries are being affected as well uh, by inflationary pressures, energy prices, the war in Ukraine. But why do you think that the OECD thinks we will be worse off? Well, I can't speak for the OECD. I respect their figures, but that's something the OECD would have to answer. Look, one of our pieces of work for us in government is to tr try and put in place policies that will mean we can come out of that position quicker, maybe defy that position. You know, we've seen predictions in the past consistently where government's been able to um, outstrip that kind of uh, prediction. And that's one of the jobs we've got. But we have had one of the fastest growing economies. That's fundamentally meant we've got the foundations to support people in the way that we can, despite really challenging economic times as we build to see more growth in the future. One of the reasons the OECD gives is that we are faring badly because of rising taxes. Is that the problem? 
Well, look, there's a whole range of challenges for the economic sector. One of the decisions the Chancellor and the Prime Minister have had to make is as we've come out of COVID, where we put in place unprecedented support for people, we're putting support, some 37 billion now, the package, to support people through the challenges of cost of living. That does mean that there are difficult decisions we have to make. We've got to be fiscally responsible, but it's also why we want to look to set out those parameters where we can reduce that tax burden as we go forward. And the chance has already outlined that he wants to be reducing tax as quickly as we can, but we've got to do that prudently. He said he'd do that in 2024, reduce income tax by 1p. Why not do it now? People need it now, don't they? Well, what we're doing now, look, people do need support now. That's why we've put that package in. And there's obviously the national insurance threshold rise next month. That means 70% of the population will see that reduction, some 300 odd pounds. We're putting one and a half billion into local authorities for support for people, as well as the winter fuel payment scheme and the fuel reduction scheme. As I say, a very, very big package of support for people right now. We want to go further. I believe in a low tax economy as a Conservative, but we've also got to do that in a fiscally sensible way after coming through a period where we have put so much support in for people. We've got to be prudent with what is taxpayers' money. But do you think the Chancellor should bring forward that tax cut? Sajid look, Javid has said that he, he would welcome it if he brought it forward. Look, we all want to see a low tax economy. The Chancellor, the Prime Minister, I think all of us as Conservatives, I certainly want to see a low tax economy as quickly as we possibly can. That encourages growth from businesses. It means more people have more money in their pockets Absolutely, to spend. Absolutely, but, but would you want but to come forward. That's I, the I would want. I'd only want it to come forward when we can afford to do it. We cannot go and burden the next generation with more debt that they then have to pay the interest on. We've got to be fiscally sensible. That's the tough decisions for government. We've never shied away from that, and I think it's right that we get that balance. It's a careful balance, and I know it's one the Chancellor and the Prime Minister are determined to get right. Let's look at something that is affecting people right now: the prices <clears> at the petrol pumps, and that is one of the most obvious signs of the the rising fuel, the rising bills that people are having to deal with. A hundred pounds to fill more than 100 pounds to fill the average uh, family car this week why don't you cut fuel duty further now well uh, obviously the uh, as i think you recognized earlier on the chancellor has put the fuel duty cut in and we've had many years obviously fuel duty freezes as well so we do what we can to support people i think that's why it's right that the chance the business secretary and as the as grant shaps has outlined today we've asked the uh, authority now the the, the uh, market authority to have a look at this to make sure do a quick review a proper review but quickly to see why and how this money is being passed on to customers we want to see this reduction being passed on to the pump so people can benefit from that because that's worth a few hundred pound a year to the average working family we've got to make sure it's being passed on and once we get the review of that then it will be right to look at what more if we need to we can do to help people to make sure it's actually getting to where we want to see that support but people need the help now don't they and actually the government is getting more money in now than before you, uh, because of before when the when you made the uh, 5p duty cut, because prices are rising so quickly, why not cut it by by 10p? Why not bring in a fuel stabiliser well, and just yeah, give look, people very, some certainty? Look, That's what the very, AA are yeah, for. it's a very fair challenge, and, it, and as I say, we all want to see lower taxes. And I know people are, are, are challenged with the not just at the fuel pump for cars, but actually on energy more generally. My part of the world in Norfolk, a lot of people are on oil-fired uh, central heating, and they've seen those prices rise as well. And we want to support that, but as I say, we've got to do that in a sense fiscally sensible way to make sure we're getting it right. It's also why it is right the Chancellor wants to see this review done to make sure that any action we do take does get passed on to people and that people get the benefit of it. But we're also at the same time, of course, incentivising business to invest because that's how we get more productivity and create more jobs and more energy security in the future. It is a difficult, complicated balance that I think the Chancellor is working to ensure we get right. What about the rail strikes which are uh, facing the country <coughs> a week on Tuesday, the first one, three in a row, which will basically bring the rail network to a halt mm. for a week. Can they be stopped? Uh, well, look, we don't, want, uh, we don't want to see the rail strikes happen at all. And I think it's disappointing we're not seeing Labour condemn these strikes. Uh, we've got a situation where that is going to be detrimental and put further pressure on working people. And actually not just working people, but people trying to get to hospital appointments, getting children to school. Um, we've got to b do everything we can to ensure that we keep a level of service in the railways. That means also we don't put more people off using the railways. We want to see more railway use. The railway uh, teams there discouraging that by creating strikes is going to make life even harder for the railways in the future. So are you going to go ahead and repeal this legal ban on bringing in agency workers so that in future, it won't work for this strike, but in future 
you can get in workers, agency workers, to cover striking staff. Is that what you're going to do? Well, look, the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, has outlined he's not taking anything off the table. He wants to have a look at everything that we can possibly do to support the rail industry and support people who want to use the railways to be able to function and to get to work. We've got a situation at the moment where I think the median salary in the, in the railway sector is about £46,000 a year already, let alone what they're asking for as an increase, against an average wage in this country of closer to £26,000. So it's a very well rewarded sector anyway. And I I think it is important that we are looking at everything we can do to keep the railways working. But you would consider changing the law so that you could bring agency workers in to replace striking staff? Well, look, as I say, the Transport Secretary has said he wants to look at everything. We're going to make sure that railways are run safely and properly, but we've got to do everything we can to ensure they're being run. So we've got to look at every option out there and explore everything we can do as a government to get the support in there to help people get to work, get to school, get to hospital, or wherever they need to get to in their everyday lives. A big day for you tomorrow. You're unveiling a bill that's going to allow the government to override parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's the agreement which provides for post-Brexit trade um, arrangements in Northern Ireland. Is this bill going to break international law? No, this bill will be within international law and we'll set that out uh, tomorrow. This, what this bill will do is fix the issues we are having with the protocol, which of course was set out to protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. At the moment, is actually fundamentally undermining it. Will you publish the full legal advice? Look, we're going to set out tomorrow, not just the bill. I and mean, When people see the bill, they'll be able to see that this is working within international law. But we'll also set out uh, the government's legal position on it. And I know people want to see our legal position, so we'll do that to make sure people see this is within interna in international law. But let's not forget, even in 2019, the then Attorney General was very clear. The primacy has to be, and for us as a government, rightly is, on the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in all three strands. And that's what we're going to focus on delivering. There are so many questions over this, though, aren't there? And whether or not you're going to break the international law. And you say categorically you're not, but there are a lot of people who say that you are. Why not publish the full legal advice just so that people can be sure about what you're being told? Well, people are giving views about it, haven't seen the bill yet. So let's let people see the bill and they'll see our legal position on it. And I think people will see this is within international law. Got to remember the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is about North South, East West, and Strand One is things like the institutions um, of Stormont, which are not functioning at the moment. Noise North South, noise East West. We've got to restore all of that. The protocol set out to do that. And of course, it said it wouldn't disrupt the everyday lives of people in their communities and it would respect the UK internal market. All of that, because of the way the EU wants to implement the protocol, is effectively in breach at the moment. We've got to restore that, fix that. We're determined to do that. And we owe that to the people, not just of Northern Ireland, but the wider UK. And we're going to do that in a way that also respects the EU single market. You've called the EU disingenuous in, mm. an, in an article today. What do you mean? Well, look, what they've been saying consistently across the media and have been reported as saying is that they're offering flexibilities. Well, they're not. What the EU are offering is some flexibility based on a fully implemented protocol. That would be actually worse than the situation we've got today because we've got a standstill, we've got grace periods, which of course were unilaterally brought in last year. That means the situation is not as bad as it would otherwise be. It would be it, those are decisions at the time we took last spring that we were criticised for, but people have recognised actually were essential. So I do think they've been disingenuous in suggesting they're being flexible, and in fact they have not shown the flexibility that's required to resolve these issues for the people of Northern Ireland. But there is a trust issue here, isn't there? And if you go in and act unilaterally on a protocol that you signed up to. With with the European Union, you did it together and now you're going in and effectively unpicking parts of it. Don't you lose the moral high ground? Don't you lose any ability to negotiate in the future? No, no, I think we've been very, we've been consistently clear about this all the way through. We want to ensure that people are not disrupted in their everyday lives in Northern Ireland. The UK internal market is respected, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and the EU single market. That's what we're going to do. It's what the protocol was supposed to do. unilaterally, aren't you? Yeah. But eventually, look, we've been trying to get a negotiation and an agreement with the EU for around 18 months now. They have not shown flexibility. They have not come forward with proposals. So you're going work. to go and do it on the your own? The business community, every single political party in Northern Ireland are all clear. The protocol in its current structure doesn't work and needs reform. We're going to set out tomorrow, I think, a practical set of proposals that fix the problems with the protocol and respect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in all three strands, which is hugely important. So would you break the law if you had to? Look, I said back in late 2020 that for me the primacy is the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And if at that point that meant uh, breaking something like the withdrawal agreement, which of course wasn't complete then, to protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, that's our primacy. But tomorrow's legislation is within international law defending and protecting the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Brandon Lewis, thank you very much. And that's it from us. See you next Sunday. Goodbye.